We are back on the phone. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome to the program uh, Rocky Anderson, the presidential candidate from the Justice Party. Welcome to the program, Rocky. Really great to be with you. Thanks very much. Uh, now, uh, Rocky, let's start. You know, I got to say, uh, back when I was on Air America, uh, I remember you from coming out and uh, being one of the only uh, public officials who uh, uh, w made a call to impeach um, uh, President George Bush. Uh, uh, tell me, just uh, before we get on to your, your race here, uh, what was behind that? What was behind it was that uh, our nation was facing one of its saddest, I think really tragic periods of time. Uh, we had been fed incredible lies by our administration, and these weren't just mistakes. These just weren't uh, reliance on bad intelligence. It was a fraud on the American people. Our president wasn't telling him what information was being provided by the intelligence community that was a, 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 diametrically the opposite of what we the people in Congress were being told. And in the course of this, we're committing a, an illegal war of aggression. Uh, it ended up with I mean, the results in terms of, of the Iraqi people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people dead, maimed, uh, a real tragedy for that country, and uh, a tragedy for ours and the number of servicemen that were injured and killed and lives ruined. And into the future, the kinds of security problems we're going to be facing for generations because of the hatred it was instilled all over the world. So the, the, those kinds of lies uh, are impeachable offenses. There were crimes committed. The, the uh, it's surveillance that was taking place without warrants, completely in violation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And then the massive human rights abuses. Our, our nation was reduced to the level of nations uh, who, in the past, we've been very proud to distinguish ourselves from, uh, that go around kidnapping and torturing and killing people without any semblance of due process. So I saw that our nation was really facing a, a frightening time, a real transformation in terms of our core values uh, and our constitutional principles. And we were developing this imperial presidency that was assuming for itself unprecedented powers, powers that have never been claimed by the President of the United States before. And Congress was sitting back. The courts were derelict in, in dismissing cases, which they continue to do on the basis of either the state secrets doctrine or the political question doctrine. There really is no checks and balances system or separation of powers as was contemplated by our founders and which guided our government uh, up until about the last decade. So I just felt like anybody in any position of power in any leadership position, really needed to stand up and call this for what it was, to challenge it and try to, to create a movement in this country to, to awaken the American people and get them to take action. And uh, clearly these were the sorts of offenses that were considered by the founders to be impeachable offenses. That's why impeachment was written into the Constitution uh, but sadly, uh, I was the only major city mayor in the country advocating for impeachment. And of those mayors I talked to, many of them said they absolutely believe in it, they love what I was doing, but they just didn't want to go out on a limb. It, they didn't feel like it was their job, their responsibility, that it might be too controversial and it might hurt them politically. Well, and uh, as long as we each take that attitude in our lives, we're never going to change anything. That's, that, that's, that was classic in Ian Esco's play Rhinoceros. Everybody's standing back as fascism was creeping into 
politics in Europe and everybody finding a reason not to stand up and challenge it. Well, I, I you know, uh, I wanted to uh, wish you a uh, just a, a belated uh, thank you and uh, tell you that, you know, at the time I was incredibly impressed. You were mayor of Salt Lake City, Utah at the time, and you came out, and it was very important to hear someone uh, who had uh, some type of official uh, position in politics and a uh, fairly major one uh, to, to uh, speak what was on the mind of, of many of us. And so I wanted to tell you, uh, start off by telling you I appreciated that. And tell me how you and when you decided to start the uh, Justice Party? Well, this has evolved during the course of several months of discussions. Uh, There was a sense that there needs to be a real second party in this country, a party that's going to help bring about a very different system. Both Republican and Democratic parties are thriving off this very corrupt, disease system that we have now where corporate interests have their way with our government. It is a true plutocracy, a government that is ruled by the wealthy. We have a pretense of democracy, of course, but the people's interests, the interests of the public are not being served by and large by our government, either by Congress or by the president. They are caving in day after day to the pressure of the lobbyists on K Street, where hundreds of million dollars are being poured in by special interests, and then, of course, by the campaign contributors upon whom they rely. Uh, You just have to follow the money. Why do we not provide the crucial international leadership on climate change that's so necessary to avoid the catastrophic consequences of climate disruption, it's because of the corrupting influence of money coming from the fossil fuels industry. Why did we not achieve major health care reform? Why did we end up with this bastardized plan that where there were so many compromises that we, the American people, are just going to be paying more and more premiums and will still not have universal health care coverage? There will still be if the Obama plan is fully implemented, 23 million people in this country without any essential health care coverage, when the rest of the industrialized world, every single nation in the industrialized world, not only provides universal health care, but they do it much, much less expensively, and most of them have better medical outcomes. And so you mentioned climate change and health care reform, and I would imagine... um uh, there is a whole raft of, uh, of issues that uh, emanate from that notion that money has corrupted our political process and has corrupted uh, both political parties. What, uh, what do you intend? I mean, uh, for a moment, uh, it is uh, 2013. Uh, we've just uh, inaugurated Rocky um, Anderson as president. What, what would you do at that point to begin to deal with this problem? Well, I I would provide the leadership. I'd be speaking directly to the American people, doing everything I can to raise consciousness about how corrupt things are. But I think people generally have that sense of it. I would give the detailed examples. I would show how, for instance, the Congress backed off, watered down this legislation they were recently considering on cutting out federal funds for student loans at a lot of these private colleges that are failing, where students come, they pay high tuitions, they take out loans that are non-dischargeable in bankruptcy, loans that are going to be hanging over their heads, perhaps for their entire lives, and yet they get out of these programs and they're not equipped to go work in the areas for which they thought they were getting the education. Congress was going to address it. These private colleges, the big companies that own these places, like Goldman Sachs and these other investment banks, they put on the push. They put millions of dollars in their lobbying effort, and they got the legislation watered down. That wasn't in the public interest. So the first thing we need to do is detail all of this. Make it transparent. Let the American people know how these failures in public policy have come about and then create the support for a constitutional amendment to overrule the Citizens United case, Uh, a, a bizarre case. 
by a bare majority of the United States Supreme Court, people who call themselves strict constructionists, but are in ways, and in that case certainly, as activist a court as there has ever been. And we need those kinds of fundamental changes in our system. We ought to also have every incentive for public financing and for candidates not to be worrying about going out and bringing in money from all these special interests in order to get elected, but getting the, the kinds of opportunities through public financing so that they don't rely, so that they're not beholden up on the, the special interests that have been buying uh, both the White House and Congress for their own purposes. And then finally, the public airwaves ought to be utilized to provide free and equal time for all candidates. I saw that in Nicaragua in 1983. We were being told by the Reagan administration that their election was a Soviet-style sham election. Well, they had seven parties that covered the entire political spectrum, and every one of them had free and equal time on national radio and national television. We've never had those kinds of democratic opportunities in our electoral system in this country. So there's plenty to do to clean up the system, get money out of government. Our government should no longer be bought and paid for. It ought to be serving the interests of the American people. All right. And so let me ask you a little bit about the Justice Party. I mean, is there, is, is there a, a platform by the Justice Party? I mean, to, to the, uh, is, is there an intention? Do you have an intention to um, build up uh, the Justice Party? Is this something that you uh, foresee um, uh, uh, existing uh, after your uh, campaign one way or another? Absolutely. This isn't about one person or one campaign. This is about a long-term grassroots movement where the public interest is going to be advocated, where we're going to be fighting to see the government act in the public interest rather than just bow down to those with the money. Um, so the Justice Party, our intention is that it be a major force in United States politics and that uh, we field candidates at every level, municipal, state, federal races, and presidential candidates in the future and that we keep this going, that it not be a fringe party, that it not just be viewed as a certain sliver on the left or the right, that it be a party that attracts people from across the political spectrum, because on the issues that we're primarily involved with, free access to the political process, open access, uh, getting people on the ballot, uh, free, providing the opportunities for people to vote when, when there's legislation now that's restricting the capacity of people to vote in many ways. Uh, opening up presidential debates so that's, that it's done truly in an independent way. Right now, the Presidential Debate Commission is a product of, it's a creation solely of the Republican and Democratic Party duopoly, and it's not in the public interest. So these are all things that the Justice Party is going to be addressing. Uh, they are developing a formal platform, but there's a lot of information on the party's website that would inform people about what the fundamentals are in terms of the party, why the party was formed. That website is justicepartyusa.org. And then also my website for my campaign is voterocky.org. And I'm limiting campaign contributions to $100. This can be done if, if everybody participates, if everybody comes together and stands up and does their share. We can pull this off in this country. We've seen in other nations the overthrow of dictatorships where people were putting their lives on the line, utilizing democratized means of communication. Uh, the social media, to organize people at the grassroots. And they've overthrown their dictatorships. We, too, in this country, utilizing much less expensive, democratized means of communication, if people will, will 
envision the changes that we can make, the possibilities of all of us joining together in a people's movement, and everybody doing their share, standing up, supporting this, we can overthrow the dictatorship of corrupt money in our government. So uh, give me a sense of, at this point, in terms of, uh, from a mechanics standpoint, um, uh, where, uh, how many states do you anticipate the Justice Party will be, um, will be uh, on the ballot? I know that in California, uh, the Justice Party needed 103,000 uh, Californians to register under the Justice Party uh, by last week. Did that happen? What states do you perceive that you will be able to get onto the ballot? Well, there, are, there are, in California, there are a number of uh, options. Uh, we only formed in December, and California has a January 2nd deadline, uh, which is outrageous. I think it's subject to challenge in the courts. It's a complete deprivation of choice for California voters. Uh, we, we, I'm sure we didn't meet the, the deadline. It would have taken not just signatures on petitions, but people actually registering as Justice Party members. But uh, so we can challenge that in the courts and, and perhaps get more time to achieve uh, that requirement of getting people registered or getting uh, over a million people to sign petitions. But there's also a possibility of me running as an independent uh, based on getting a number of signatures on petitions or also the possibility of my name being there on the line reserved for another party. Uh, there's the Peace and Freedom Party in California. Certainly there are a lot of values, a lot of places where we have similar concerns, and uh, I uh, might be able to get on the ballot as the candidate for the Peace and Freedom Party. So, um, I mean, uh, when you decided to run, and, and you decided somewhat late, I mean, uh, Justice Party forms in December, you've, you've, you've got all of these sort of mechanical hurdles uh, facing you. What is, at the end of uh, the day, uh, you know, uh, come November 3rd, I mean, what is the, uh, what is the agenda? I mean, have you, are you hoping to have built this party or to have uh, headed down that road? Or are you hoping to have the opportunity to express um, these, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your issues and policies on your, on your site, and uh, these are all par uh, issues that I would agree with and subscribe to. Uh, what is the ultimate agenda, uh, you know, both uh, short, mid, and long term? Well, Sam, pe people talk about us getting into this late. Uh, there are almost no other nations that carry on campaigns as long as we do in the United States. Uh, this actually... Uh, if we get everybody working and we get people to join this grassroots movement, this can be done. Uh, we, we can be a major force in this election. And who knows, uh, there, there might be the kind of miracle where we pull the people together. Who expected that the Egyptian people would be able to come together in a people's movement and overthrow their dictator? Uh, so, but even if that doesn't happen, uh, there's a great book by Tom Friedman and Michael Mandelbaum uh, entitled That Used to Be Us. And they end that book by calling for the creation of a major new political party in this country. And they point out that if you're able to get out and address these issues and look the American people in the eye and tell them, look, the Democrats and Republicans are lying to you and they can't do otherwise because they're bought off by all these special interests. And here are the kinds of things that we need to do to get back to the American formula for greatness, the kinds of commitments that we need to make and the, the changes that we need to make. Get out of these wars. Stop wasting so much money on these wasteful defense budgets. Well, excuse me, the defense is a total... It's... It's the, it's the wrong word to use. These are military budgets. We haven't used our military for defense purposes in a long time. But we can make these changes in our system of government when we all pull together. And as they point out in that book, even if the alternative party candidate loses, that kind of a movement can have a greater impact on our nation and on our world 
than perhaps even the candidate who ends up prevailing because the American people have gotten behind it. And they give several examples of when that's happened with Teddy Roosevelt when he ran as a progressive party candidate. Almost his entire platform ended up being adopted after his loss as an alternative party candidate. Uh, Ross Perot was the only person when he first ran talking about our budget problems and deficits and, and how that was all impacting the American people and the future of this country. Well, Bill Clinton ended up building up surpluses. He ended his term with major surpluses in the budget. A lot of that has to be attributed to what Ross Perot did and the attention that was paid then by the American people on those issues. So we can make great changes if everybody hangs together and supports this party and my campaign. I got to say, I, I imagine Thomas Friedman is talking about Americans elect, but uh, be that as may, the, I guess the principle still uh, remains. Um, l l let me get your perspective. There's a lot of, uh, in the uh, progressive uh, community, a lot of people who are talking, and there's a big argument about uh, the, uh, I guess, the, the value of Ron Paul in this election. Uh, not so much to be directly supported, but in terms of uh, his espousing um, the uh, criticism of the American empire. And I see, um, in, in, and this is something that uh, in, in maybe perhaps not so many words, but you are uh, arguing the same thing. I mean, what do you say to those uh, disaffected progressives uh, and liberals uh, who see uh, Ron Paul as providing at least uh, some voice there? Uh, what, what do you say to those people? Well, I say to those people that Ron Paul stands for a lot of things that you will absolutely disagree with. The, the, the reason Ron Paul has had, I think, as, as much attention and support as he has is he's the only one among those that, are, that the mainstream media are paying any attention to that is calling to get out of these wars, uh, to not go around the world dominating both economically and militarily. But he's also a guy who says that government has, doesn't have a role in so many areas, including the regulation of pollution, uh, environmental programs. He says the answer to our environmental problems is strict observance of private property rights. Uh, I think that's just a crock. Uh, he, he, Ron Paul is a total isolationist. He would not advocate for the United States to join with the international community to intervene to end genocides. It was bad enough that President Clinton sat on his hands during the genocide in Rwanda in 1994 when he could have provided the leadership along with France in the United Nations and put an end to that butchery. We had a legal obligation to do it. We've adopted, ratified the Genocide Convention. And if we're going to meet the promises of never again that we made after the Holocaust, that kind of isolationism is so destructive in the long term. And I don't see our moral obligations ending with political boundaries the way that Ron Paul does. And I certainly believe the government has a major role in ending racial discrimination. Ron Paul thinks that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibiting discrimination on account of race and public accommodations is somehow an infringement on our personal freedoms. I think that is just downright bizarre. Uh, he, he's calling for the kind of government that is, uh, I, I think, unrecognizable to most of us. And progressives should reject that, and they should embrace those who have been fighting against these wars, as I have, for years, who have been advocating for a restoration of the rule of law, as I have for years. Uh, I, I've been working on these issues. I formed High Road for Human Rights right after I left the mayor's office, addressing these issues, but I was addressing them also when I was in the mayor's office. And for 21 years before I was mayor, I was representing people who had been injured as a result of corporate and governmental abuses of power. So uh, there, there is a great option here uh, for people who are concerned about these issues. It's not Ron Paul. It's the Justice Party 
And in this instance, it's Rocky Anderson running for president of the United States. I know you just got uh, just a couple minutes here, but uh, uh, I've, I've heard you address this on, uh, in other interviews, uh, that uh, you had some hesitation about jumping into the race because you didn't want to necessarily um, uh, be the difference between uh, President Obama, let's say, and uh, whoever ends up being uh, the Republican nominee. Um, uh, tell me about that decision, that struggle, and what your feelings are on it uh, now that you've been campaigning uh, for a couple of months. Well, I did struggle with that, and then it occurred to me, we're never going to see a change in our system of government. All we're going to do is move around the players according to the rules that have been set in this really corrupt game called government in the United States. And we'll never see that major shift to get the impact, the corrupting impact of money out of our government if we won't stand up for that kind of a change. And the only way to do that is with an alternative party. And that's why I decided not only should we do this, we have to do this if we're going to change things around in this country. We're going to see a continuation. I mean, my goodness, the lesser of two evils, according to most people now, signs legislation and actually advocated for legislation that gives him the power to indefinitely detain even American people without charges, without legal representation, without a trial. It's absolutely un-American. He's turned his back on the rule of law in so many different ways. He's supported Wall Street. He's surrounded himself with Goldman Sachs people. He has turned his back in so many ways on the American people, and especially his base, who are completely disillusioned now. And uh, uh, lastly, l give me your, your sense of Occupy Wall Street, because, uh, you know, I, I personally have found Occupy Wall Street uh, to provide a, uh, has opened up uh, what I perceive as, a, as another avenue uh, in which to make that change that is running on a uh, parallel and in many respects distinct track from electoral politics. Well, except we're still going to have elections, and I would right. urge anybody involved in the Occupy movement, keep doing what you're doing, because we haven't been addressing these issues. The Occupy movement has brought more attention to the economic disparity in this country, which is greater than it's been at any time since the 1920s. There have been people writing about it. There have been people who have had that sense. But the Occupy movement has brought real focus on these injustices. And there, there is tremendous confluence here between what we're working on and what the Occupy movement has done. And uh, I'm very proud of everyone who's been involved in that. I've been very supportive. And I think that we provide the electoral component. We provide the option for those in the Occupy movement, those who support the Occupy movement. We provide the electoral component to getting these solutions in place and making the kinds of fundamental changes that we need to see in our government. And I might also say, don't just listen to people and what they say during campaigns. Take a look at what they've done with their lives. Take a look at where their passions are, what their core beliefs are, what their commitments are, because that's going to be the best sign in terms of what they're going to do once they're in office. President Obama, he had none of this. He had no executive experience. He wasn't a mayor who was standing up on these issues. Even when he was in the United States Senate, he wasn't standing up against torture. He voted consistently for the illegal occupation of Iraq. He, he switched his vote. He said he was going to uh, join a filibuster to block retroactive immunity for the telecom companies who had uh, worked with the Bush administration and its illegal surveillance program. And then as soon as he got the Democratic nomination, he turned 180 degrees, betrayed that promise and voted for that immunity. That kind of immunity is so consistent with everything else he has done when he says, let's look forward, not backwards. And basically ignore war crimes, basically ignore the felonies committed in engaging in illegal surveillance on the American people. What kind of leadership is that? This country has been absolutely transformed in the last 10 years. The two Bush administrations and now the Obama administration. 
and both administrations going into the courts and getting cases dismissed when they're brought by victims of torture, those who challenge illegal surveillance, getting those cases dismissed on the basis of the state secrets doctrine, which in essence is rendering completely neutral the courts as a check on abuses of executive power. That spells tyranny. It spells an imperial presidency that's unprecedented in this country. And we all need to get back to our core values in this country and honor our Constitution, honor what's been very best about our nation, honor the kinds of things that made our nation distinguished from those totalitarian human rights abusing countries from whom we used to so proudly distinguish ourselves, but now whose practices we seem to be replicating in many instances. We just have that opportunity to do this, and I think we've got a real obligation to the future to get the job done. The uh, sites are VoteRocky.org, and the Justice Party is at JusticePartyUSA.org. We'll put both those at the uh, the site at Majority.fm. Rocky Anderson, I appreciate your coming on. I hope to see you on the, that debate stage uh, with uh, President Obama and uh, whoever ends up being the Republican nominee. Uh, and um, I wish you good luck. Sam, thank you very much. Great to talk to you again. Great to talk to you, too.